Welcome to Arden University Brain Awareness Week podcast. We invite you to our episode with Dr. Chris Friesen, neuroscientist, director of Friesen Sports and Performance Psychology, writer of book Achieve. Let's discover in this episode how neuroscience may help you unleash your full potential. Hello, everybody. This is Carlos and Anna, students with Arden University, following our master in psychology, and we are proudly members of Arden University Brain Awareness Week Student Committee. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to our podcast today. We are so honored to have here with us Dr. Chris Friesen, um, professor uh, uh, and uh, director for Friesen Sport and Performance Psychology. Welcome, Dr. Friesen. We are so happy to have you here. Here with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So you're the author of the book uh, Achieve, uh, and I have it here with me actually. <laughs> uh, Achieve, find out who you are, what you really want, and how to make it happen. And you provide like exceptional advices, um, and uh, you provide evidence uh, also for techniques to build willpower and to improve. Uh, uh, our uh, neurocognition and you are backed uh, you backed up the information by neuroscience uh, so how can we build new habits and how can we teach students te- uh, teacher uh, and children to prepare uh, for the for exams you know how to empower us with different uh, ways to to perform better because mm-hmm. this podcast is really really to uh, create awareness how to uh, get better to use uh, our highest uh, level, um, our brains, right, mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. the right moment, and to take advantage, and also to empower parents and students and educators to help the children with whom they work, and also for themselves. So, uh, your advice would be of high help. Yeah, no problem. Um, just to step back, so I'm also a neuropsychologist or clinical neuropsychologist, which is a subspecialty within clinical psychology that specializes in brain and behavior. Um, So I have multiple hats. I'm a neuropsychologist, clinical psychologist, which focuses mostly on depression, anxiety, this sort of thing. Um, I see children all the way up to senior citizens. And I'm also a sport and performance psychologist. So uh, these areas, uh, my my, my knowledge base is a, a mixture of these things. So when it comes to students, let's say in exams and developing good habits, what are the most important things This is something I call the law of contrasting. And it's not in my book, unfortunately. Maybe my next book it'll be in. Um, The law of contrasting uh, is this. It's a well-known neuroscientific sort of principle that when we do something that it basically helps us focus and uh, do uh, get motivated and uh, feel interest in things we're doing. So, for example, studying. A lot of students have a hard time getting themselves to do things they don't feel like doing, like studying. And just as an example, over the uh, the COVID uh, virtual schooling break for a lot of people, I had a lot of parents uh, call me and ask me questions about why their, their son or daughter has a hard time sitting down at 9 a.m. and focusing and uh, doing uh, virtual schooling. And so I usually ask them, what were they doing before that? So what happened after they woke up in the morning between that and nine o'clock? And what they often say is, well, they're playing video games or Xbox, or they're watching television. And I say, well, this is similar to asking your child to eat broccoli after they've had ice cream. This works on a very microscopic uh, neurological level from taste buds all the way up to a global psychological level. So when we do things that are really stimulating, they, you know, there's a lot of uh, release of dopamine and a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, it's what we call arousing in psychology or activating and makes us excited. Uh, it's very difficult to go from that state to something that's actually slow and boring. So in business, they call this eat the frog. So in other words, you want to make sure that your your kids and students, that they are doing the more difficult and boring things first. And this applies to everyone. I work with entrepreneurs. I work with athletes. It's the same thing. You do the more difficult and boring things first, and then you do the more pleasurable, fast-paced, and interesting things later. It serves as a reward, but it also helps your brain not get oversaturated because, again, fun things to boring things are very difficult transitions. So that is one thing. Another thing we know is when it comes to nutrition, so just to be clear, I'm not a registered dietitian, I'm a psychologist, but there's a lot of research on nutrition and how the brain and our cognition and our psychology functions. One is if you want to focus 
and you want to, your child to focus. I also work with a lot of uh, ADHD. It's a big special sub, sub, uh, subspecialty of mine um, is diagnosing, assessing, and treating uh, ADHD. And one of the things we know is that if you want to focus and you want your child to be able to uh, do work that they don't feel like doing, uh, they you know have a, a higher protein meal before. And there's a few reasons for this. If you if your child has let's say uh, a sugar cereal, um, they're going to get an in, a, you know, a spike of glucose, so they'll feel energized for a short period of time, and then their blood glucose will crash uh, because of the spike in insulin. The problem is, of course, not only that your uh, blood sugar crashes, and therefore your, your brain is not getting the fuel it needs. But also, if you have a higher protein meal, there is an amino acid uh, called tyrosine that is required for our brains to produce uh, dopamine. So all ADHD medication, uh, sorry, all most of the main ADHD medications like Ritalin, Concerta, uh, these medications, they increase dopamine availability in the brain. Dopamine makes you interested and helps you focus and improves something called executive functioning. In other words, your ability to inhibit yourself, organize, plan, all the things that are necessary and all the things that kids lack. It's once we become adults, it's not actually till ages 25 to 30 now that our frontal lobes, the big foreheads that we have, that they actually um, uh, develop fully. And this is one of the reasons why when you try to get car insurance, uh, your insurance is much higher when you're less than 25 years old. It's not because they're neuroscientists that work for car insurance companies. It's just because mm -hmm. statistics, we know that uh, when, we're, when our frontal lobes aren't very good, we end up getting to more accidents. And they know that just by the statistics. So those are a couple of tips right off the bat that I think could be helpful for parents and educators to know. Wow, excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. It was, no problem. It was amazing information. Um, Carlos, do you have a question? No, I actually I don't have any questions, but uh, the topic is very interesting. When we try to realize that the type of food that we digest before either academic performance, either athletic performance, it, it has a huge impact. This is very yeah. interesting to see because... There is a lot of kids that go to school and they pretty much don't eat anything. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are. I, I'm, I'm not aware the the, the the social context in the United States or Canada, but I'm well, uh, well uh, alert about what's happening here in Europe. And actually, most of the kids go to school without pretty much eating anything. Wow. So they just start school without eating anything, and their focus and their attention is not the most desirable, you know. And as time passed by, those kids being marked as lazy, being marked as difficult kids, and mm -hmm. a lot of social and a lot of cognitive situations complicated when they start being marked as they are at that point. So interesting topic, very interesting. Thank you very much for sharing with us. No problem. Mm -hmm. And related to that is, is sleep and exercise. Let's, let's just to maybe touch on those. Um, I actually have a, a YouTube channel um, mm -hmm. uh, called Friesen Performance with Dr. Chris Friesen. I just made this up uh, over the pandemic uh, to help get the, to share with clients and to get a, get wider, a wider audience for people to hear and understand these things. And I have a, a multiple part series on sleep, uh, multiple part series on willpower and motivation. And I'm still developing these videos as we speak. Um, one of the things we know with sleep, if you don't sleep well, your, your, your child doesn't sleep well, their performance, their cognitive performance uh, gets hampered. Their processing speed, in other words, how quickly their brain can process information, um, their attention, their ability to sustain attention um, is going to be weakened if they don't sleep enough. Uh, there's a lot of things. And interestingly, and I bring this up in one of my videos, when, when I do assessments of, for ADHD, there is a biomarker. It's called the theta-beta ratio. In other words, about 85% of kids and adults with ADHD have excessive or too much slow wave activity in the central and front part of the brain. Uh, this is why stimulant medication helps. Some people don't understand this. They think, why is why would you give a child who's so, so hyperactive and is all over the place, why would you give them a stimulant like slow-release amphetamine? And the reason is because the brain is actually running too slowly. And it doesn't mean slow thinking. It means it's underactivated, under aroused again. And so what we know, this was an amazing marker. So what 85% of ADHD kids have this. What we know now is that newer studies were finding that this marker isn't as accurate. And the reason for this is because all kids are having trouble sleeping. Their, their gadgets, the blue light that these gadgets uh, produce uh, affects our brain's ability to release melatonin, which is a hormone that allows us to go to sleep and controls our 24-hour cycle or circadian rhythm. 
Mm -hmm. And so what happens is normal kids or kids who don't have ADHD are showing a high theta beta ratio. So their brains look like ADHD kids. So it's not as good at differentiating between the two groups. Um, And so sleep is of absolute importance. Parents and kids and everyone who wants to know, you know, how to maximize your performance is to really prioritize sleep, uh, avoid bright lights, avoid anything that activates you psychologically, like, uh, really exciting video games, uh, scary movies, <laughs> things like this, arguments, anything within a few hours of bed, even large meals, these will basically negatively affect your ability to get into deep sleep and deep sleep is required to make uh, our memories. So learn the thing, like to consolidate the memories we made from school, for example, the, the day before, if we don't get deep sleep, we will not remember these. So this is essential. There's another part of this. Early in the mornings, you want to be exposed to bright light And unfortunately, our tablets and our computers, they're really bad for our brains in the evening, primarily because of the blue light. But in the mornings, they're not strong enough. You actually need sunlight or sometimes a a light box that they use for seasonal affective disorder, about 10,000 lux, lux is brightness. The sun is like 100,000 lux, but our lights in our house are maybe 500 lux. Um, You need this bright light within about an hour of waking up for about 20 to 30 minutes uh, to tell your brain that in about 14 hours, it's time to go to sleep. And this bright light exposure in the morning, it, besides helping you sleep at night, it actually improves your mood. So in other words, it help, it increases serotonin. So that's another neurotransmitter that are used in antidepressants. So serotonin reduces negative emotions in general and makes you feel generally satisfied. And so it has a mood boosting effect because of this, because you feel just better. Um, and so this is another thing, making sure you get light exposure in the mornings from your windows or going outside, or if you're in uh, in the Northern uh, hemispheres, uh, uh, you, where there's very little light when you wake up in the mornings, um, you know, using a light box, of course, be careful because if you have eye conditions or skin conditions, some of these light boxes might be difficult or bad for you. So you'd have to check with your doctor, but that light exposure. Uh, and then the other thing is exercise. They say exercise is equivalent to taking Prozac, again, which is an antidepressant, which increases serotonin, which makes you feel less negative emotions, and Ritalin, which is an ADHD medication, which increases dopamine, which makes you more alert, uh, more interested, more focused, and have better executive functioning. Uh, And exercise has been shown to be about equivalent to those medications in terms of what we call effect sizes or how strong the effect is. And so if your child is struggling in school uh, to stay motivated, to stay focused, you want to help them uh, get exercise in. And it's not like you think in the sense of you got to work out for two hours, like at a gym, and then you sit on your butt the rest of the day. That's not how it works. Um, so for example, if your child's having trouble sitting down and doing, let's say 20 minutes of homework before they're getting out of their seat, before they seem to be losing focus, one option is to get them out of their seat and you know, do some sort of act, physical activity. It could be just for three to five minutes And that's going to increase their ability to focus and go back to the task. Um, And so having this, having a timer out and and, and saying, let's go, it's kind of like in a sport, you kind of go hard for 10 minutes and you take it easy, you go hard, you go take it easy. And this is extremely important um, to, to help kids because the reality is our school system is not set up for kids. Um, our school system has like young children sitting on their, their behinds all day long for hours and hours with little short breaks. And they seem to be reducing, at least in, in North America here, physical education time, uh, music, uh, art, they're, they're you know, reducing a lot of this and a lot of, especially with COVID restrictions, at least here in Canada, they're reducing uh, time outside, etc. And all these are having a detrimental effect on our kids' ability to learn. There's many other tips I can I can I can add to this, but I'll let you guys ask any other questions. These are absolutely amazing uh, amazing tips. So everyone, anyone who would like to know more about, uh, we're gonna share uh, in our podcast. We're gonna share the link uh, on which they could go to to find more um, with your uh, thoughts and advices. So it's about food, sleep, exercise. These are key <laughs> key elements exactly. <laughs> yes. Very, very. Good yes. To, to have it. Thank you very much, Dr. Frieza. No problem. Okay. So, um, Carlos, would you like to launch the, the other question? Yeah, definitely. I have topics that I would like to discuss a little bit with Dr. Frieza, but we can sure. do it uh, after. No worries. 
So, uh, Dr. Fraser, question number two. So, I have found that the five-minute rule is an amazing tool. I'm applying it on a daily basis, kind of. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit more about it and how to use it in real life? Yes. Yeah, for sure. So, okay. the five-minute yeah, the five-minute rule is uh, is a very useful tool. Um, Definitely, <laughs> everyone should be using this. Uh, uh, students, teachers, parents, everyone. Um, Essentially, the way it works like this, our brains, uh, you know, are designed to um, part of our brains It's called the limbic system, which is the emotional part of our brains, which is like the mammalian part of our brains or the animal mind or the monkey mind. There's different words people use to describe this. Yeah. These are a part of our brains that are really emotionally based uh, and versus more logical parts of our brain. So the limbic system is deeper within our brain, um, includes the amygdala, which is a negative emotion centers, et cetera. Um, the frontal lobe, which is, we have these big foreheads, bigger than gorillas and, 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 and monkeys. And this is why we're smarter than them. We have this giant frontal lobe that makes us the most dominant species. And this is why even, uh, even uh, you know, science fiction depictions of funny aliens, they have these huge heads, right? Exactly. Big brains, exactly. <laughs> right? Um, uh, so, so, but this is, this, this, um, this part of our brain, the limbic system, the emotional part of our brains uh, is designed to protect us in the short term. It has no ability to think long term, which is basically who we want to be, our goals, our values, what's important to us. So our limbic system tends to over predict how hard things are going to be, uh, you know, uh, how much you're going to like something. Uh, it basically predicts usually to the negative. So when it comes to, yeah, yeah. So when it comes to, um, for example, let's just say doing homework, um, our brains uh, or for adults, it would be like doing our taxes, or something that we don't feel like doing. It's boring. And it's not something that you may be really motivated to do. But what you do, you make a deal. You say, I'm going to do this for five minutes, whether it's homework, whether it's working out, whether it's your taxes, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do this for five minutes. If it's anywhere as bad as my brain predicted, again, which is really your limbic system, which is illogical and is only trying to reduce pain, the pain of effort. Um, it doesn't want us to feel any pain because this helps us survive. Um, uh, but we're not living in, in the savannah anymore, where there's the pain is like, uh, you know, a, a snake that's going to kill us. Um, uh, so if it's anywhere as bad as our mind predicted, we give ourselves permission to stop. And because we're going in with faulty information, we're going in with a bias that this is going to be difficult and this is going to be hard. Right. So you do it for five minutes and then you ask yourself, OK, do I really want is this as bad as I thought it would be? And about 98% of the time, you'll find that it's never as bad and you want to continue. Um, so when I wrote my book, Achieve, if I only wrote my book when I felt inspired, when I felt motivated, when I, my mind was saying to me, you're a great writer, everyone's going to love this book, you know, it would take me a thousand years to write the book. I had to just start every time I you know, had on my schedule, I was going to write the book. I just had to start working on it. And that's you know, then I continue to go. It was my predictions. Of, oh man, I don't feel like doing this today. Were uh, basically nowhere close to um, uh, nowhere close to as bad as I thought it would be. So this is a really, really useful tool. Just having a name, the five minute rule, which means I'm going to do it for five minutes and then decide. Uh, and it's it, it can help you get over procrastination. That's really what it is. It's a quote unquote cure for procrastination. Yes. And it's uh, it looks like a very powerful tool, actually, mm -hmm. because uh, since you describe your experience and your feelings regarding to the way that you wrote your book, I can tell kind of the same situation as my as my own. I'm struggling a lot with parenting, job uh, related things, and mm -hmm. personal life. So this five minute rule is. It's very important for me because it only takes five minutes to see how things are not so hard as it is. It mot motivates me either to build a wider agenda or just doing the task itself. So it's very, very, very significant for me in that sense. Exactly. Yeah. Even I'm doing like myself when I started to to do my exercises and I'm not really in the mood, right? Like not we are not always. But I realized, okay, if I'm going and following a schedule and I say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start up with five minutes. I'm going to get, and I'm getting to 10 to 15 as I've started to run. Okay. I'm going to do for, for five or 10 minutes, no matter what, I'm going to go outside. I'm going to do my, you know, my jogging. Mm -hmm. And also implemented with uh, with my uh, youngest one is the same thing. You have to just start. And I realized it's working. And this is an amazing tool to be, you know, uh, applied like in schools. It's just 
about this. And I really loved like uh, in your book, like all the quotes, if you take like it's one uh, by Napoleon Hill um, was a goal is a dream with a deadline because Mm -hmm. we all have those goals. And, you know, sometimes I put like the goal number one, two, three. But if I don't have a deadline, will never happen. Never happen. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> this is an amazing, an amazing tool to apply with us and with with children. And I think if it's like implementing since you are young, it's going to be like there. It's going to stay with you. That's right. It, right? It's true. It, and it, once we understand how the brain and mind works, in a sense, we can hack the system. And, it, and once we understand that, that's not reality or that's not necessarily accurate. It could be. But this predictions, if you're, you know, friends ask you to go out and you don't feel like going out, for example, and, um, you know, often it's just your mind is over predicting how bad it's going to be or how tired you feel. Um, And it's not very accurate, but it's doing what it's supposed to do. That's the limbic system. Its only job is to think in the very short term, what can eliminate any uncomfortable feelings or pains right now, which if I say no, I don't have to do this, then it seems to reduce that. But of course, what happens if we listen to our limbic system? our life gets basically goes downhill because we're not living in line with our goals and values. We're not being the people we want to be. We're not accomplishing anything. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I've been on podcasts and, and they've asked me, what's the one thing that makes people, that differentiates people who are successful, whether it's students, whether it's adults, whether it's professional athletes. At first I thought that's a silly question. I don't have a one thing, but then I thought about it. I thought, you know, there is one thing. It's simply this, the most successful people in whatever we're referring to students, athletes, professionals, whatever, doesn't matter. The most successful people make their daily decisions about what to do with their time based on their goals and their values, not based on their moods, not based on their energy levels, not based on what their mind says they can and cannot do, and not even somebody's based on your circumstances. You base it on who I want to be and what do I want to achieve. And when we do that, we get much better and we get better at everything and get closer to our goals. It's it's um, it's there's a big myth out there that you need to be confident before you take action. In other words, let's say starting a podcast or starting a project, starting a you know a, a, an essay. You know, you need to know everything before you start. And this is this is backwards. It's, that's not how the brain works. Confidence comes from disproving your mind. So, uh, you know, when you tell a child who is just afraid to jump off a, a diving board, you can tell them, you know, for a long time how much it's how safe it is, etc. They don't really actually learn until they jump off. And then all of a sudden they learn very quickly in literally three seconds. Um, you can tell a child never to touch a hot stove. So we actually don't, as children, we don't really learn logically. We learn mostly emotionally about how to behave. And so you can tell a child, don't touch the stove, don't touch the stove. It's not really until they touch it once or they get really close yeah. and they feel that heat. Then they learn with what, the, what we call one trial learning in psychology, uh, yeah. one pairing of That red stove and that pain go together, and therefore I will never touch this again. So this is really important that we uh, we don't have to wait until we're confident. We don't have to listen to our minds. We just do the things we know we should do, and confidence comes as a side effect of that. Right. It's it's about also fear, right? So Mm -hmm. yeah, it's in a way we we change uh, and because of the fear, and but in the same time we can change to reach our our goals it's possible to change our values but not really changing personalities right because as you said in your book like you cannot change an introvert on, into an extrovert or vice versa maybe for you know <laughs> some limited time mm-hmm. so we can we can change values and we can to to reach the goals uh, but not necessarily changing who we are who who we, we are as that's right. That's right. that's right. Our our personality have a very strong genetic and biological component. Temp- <laughs> when we have personalities as kids, we call it temperaments. Um, anyone who says has kids, there's more than one child, despite having the same parents and the same home and the same parenting style, they're very different. Yeah. And it's nothing to do with your parenting style. It has to do with their with basically their biology. Um, one thing I will say though, as children. Our personalities are much more malleable. There's something called neuroplasticity. I'm sure you're all familiar with now. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that, yeah, and so our brain changes with experience. And the more we do certain things, it changes our brain. And just like you were mentioning earlier, when we the habits we develop as children and teenagers, when the brain is still developing, those become lifelong habits. 
Um, so that's something just to keep in mind that, that what you, you know, to change, it's like, it gets, what, what's the saying? You, it's hard to, uh, 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 teach an old dog new tricks. So an older person, if, if we, we just have less neuroplasticity if we're 50 or 60 years old. Uh, it makes sense. We're, we're designed to learn very quickly as children. And once we're older, uh, you know, it doesn't matter as much. We've already reproduced. <laughs> We've already, you know, all that uh, in terms of evolution. Many things, it's, right? yeah. it's already happened. Um, and so uh, this is just something to keep in mind. So our personalities are what we call set like plaster by the time you're about 25 to 30 years old. Um, and set, plaster is hard, but it's still breakable, but it's difficult to break. You need a, a tool like a hammer to break it. So um, when we when we do long, longitudinal studies, so you follow people, let's say for 30 or 40 years, or actually one study I think was 50 years, and you get their rank order. So in other words, if you take 100 people and you order them in terms of, let's say, who's the most extroverted versus who's the least extroverted, in other words, introverted, um, there's a very high correlation between your standing. Let's say you're number 98. So the chance of our 50 years, you're going to still be number 98 in that cohort because there are some mild changes in your personality as we age as well as a population. But uh, so our personalities are difficult to change, um, but our values and our beliefs, those are much easier to change. You, you can you can watch a documentary on, I'm making this up, watch a documentary on where your meat comes from or something like this. And, and all of a sudden you become a vegan overnight. Right. Um, uh, that's not a change in personality. Uh, that's a change in your, in your, what's important to you, your values. So values are, who do I want to be? What's important to me? Um, you know, versus uh, personality traits are, you know, I easily experience negative emotions or I like uh, a lot of stimulation, which would be like an extrovert, you know, or I, I'm naturally motivated and um, organized. So this is like something called conscientiousness. In my book, I call this motivation and self-control. Um, those are very difficult to change, but you can change your individual behaviors. So, so, so uh, there's also not a, what I call a good or bad personality profile. Uh, in the public, uh, there's this perception that there's a perfect personality profile. I, I wholeheartedly disagree. Um, essentially, for example, high, high levels of negative emotions and stress. In the literature, it's called neuroticism or negative affect. Most people think there's nothing good about that. What would be good it would easily experience those, those, those uh, negative emotions and stress. The reality is uh, people who are in helping professions, like often teachers, therapists, doctors, people who are, are professional athletes, people who are uh, artists, whether they're actors, novelists, uh, sculptors, they tend to be higher in negative on this personality dimension of a susceptibility to negative emotions and stress. The reason is they can use that understanding, those own feelings they experience to, let's say, let's say an author. They wouldn't be able to write about characters going through difficult experiences unless they have their own personal experience of what does it feel like to be anxious, to be feeling guilty, feel afraid, to feel anger. Um, they don't easily have a lot of experience with that. It's very difficult to do that. Same with an actor. Uh, athletes often use this to channel their negative emotions into performance. So, for example, as children, um, some children experience have a lot of negative emotions as part of their personality. Uh, and they also tend to be uh, low on conscientiousness. They have a hard time motivating themselves to do things. But what can happen is high levels of negative emotions, when they start to cause problems, that can motivate them to learn how to cope with that by being more conscientious and motivated. So, for example, the, you can break up your day into tasks. I have a video on this on YouTube, uh, but it's uh, it was Dwight Eisenhower, former president of the United States. Uh, he came up with this. It's called the Time Management Matrix. Uh, Stephen Covey from The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he popularized this in his successful, his really successful self-help book. Um, and so you can break your, your, your activities into these four quadrants. The most important ones for this are quadrant one. So we're ranking these in terms of importance and urgency. So quadrant one activities are activities that are urgent and important. So these are things that are non-negotiable that you have to do. Like you have to go to your job. You have to, um, uh, you know, eat food. And there's certain things that are, that are non-negotiable. They're urgent and they're important. But the more time we spend in something called quadrant two, which are not urgent but important, the more successful we become. So these are things like uh, learning uh, learning how to study as opposed to just cramming for an exam, which would be quadrant one is cramming. Um, this would be personal development. This would be uh, reading. This would be in, uh, you know investing in relationships. Uh, this would be continuing education. Those are not urgent, but they're important. And the more time we spend in quadrant two, the less stress and anxiety uh, we experience. 
because it obviously it's making us move forward uh, and it reduces, you know, reduces the fires we have to put out. You can think of this, for example, for a student. So if you need to study, um, you can wait to the last minute before an exam and cram. And so all of a sudden it's now urgent and important. And so you have no choice. Or if you slowly study, which we know from research that when you are exposed to information, small bits over many weeks and days, your brain will actually remember this. And anyone who's got experience, like, you know, most of us have been in school for, I have multiple, two undergrad degrees and two graduate degrees. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's insane in terms of how much studying. So we start to learn certain things. And when we cram for tests, we don't remember that information over the long term. But when we study consistently, we do better on the test, first of all, and then we retain that information. So slowly studying little bits every day is going to help you. And those are not urgent, but they're important. And they're quadrant two. And that's going to reduce your stress and actually improve your grades. And kids can learn this. They can learn that when they focus more on quadrant two, they are going to reduce problems, reduce stress, and get to where they want to be. So it doesn't matter so much how high your IQ is. Um, it really matters how much you're willing to put in some of this work. But you have to do things like the five-minute rule because our brain's going to say, oh, it's too hard. It's not even yeah. due. What's the big deal? And so you have to know how the brain works. Then you can help yourself achieve the goals that are important to you. Yes. Yes, you 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 just said it. You, this is why we do this to know about the brain and to just to share information with uh, mm. people around us. It's it's mm. so important. These tools and these advice is absolutely amazing for uh, for us for our uh, listeners. Mm. Yeah, mm. and uh, Dr. Fraser, let me let me just say one thing. Actually, uh, one of the questions that we have prepared to you, you just you just answer it exactly. Uh -huh. the, all the recommendations that we could put it regarding to how could we help educators, students, or persons in general to succeed, to inspire, to succeed. You just went straight to the point. It was mm -hmm. so inspiring to, to, to listen that we should divide our tasks in different types of bunks. Of, it's amazing. And actually, it helps quite a lot to be productive because uh, I do myself find uh, I'm kind of a pro procrastinator person, kind of. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I've struggled to keep the balance between professional, personal, and the other box, as I call it. So those strategies help me quite a lot to balance my life and to give me also self-confidence, well, to achieve whatever I want to achieve. So this is quite inspiring. Thank you very much, Dr. Fraser. Thank you very much to, to deal with this. <laughs> Thank you. No problem at all. Mm. On that note, the, another thing that can be related to that and important is um, this has come up a lot with the, the, with, the, with the lockdowns. A lot of people are working from home. Um, and you can apply this to students as well, is it helps to have a particular computer or room or even the clothes you wear that you're in what we call work mode. So our brain has lots of associations. So for example, right now I'm in my, my home office and this is, I don't watch YouTube here. I don't um, do anything fun, I don't watch movies here. I sit on my couch on a, a laptop to do those things. Um, and so I, we kind of associate basically what we're wearing. Uh, so when you want to be working, um, you know, people work from home, for example, or students at home, put on your clothes as if you're going to school, put on your shoes um, and, you know, only study in a particular part of your house. Like Stephen King and lots of famous authors, they'll do things where they have one particular room that that's all they do. When they go there, they don't do anything. It's not even connected to the internet. But if you're on the, if your child's on the same computer doing homework that they play Fortnite or some video game on, it's gonna, it's not gonna go well. You need a, a different uh, sort of setting. And again, it's it's from everything from what you what you're wearing to the time of day uh, to the room to the device you're using. And for example, so if you're coming home from school, it's probably not good to have them do homework on the couch. It's you know have them in a special room and to finish that homework. And once that's done, you transition, you take off, you put on your fun, easy clothes, you go and now you're in the living room or some other room. And it's a different, different mindset because we need to also separate work from pleasure and recovery. And if our, you know, with today's uh, technology, with text messaging and emails, and so we can, this can be really problematic for teachers and everybody that we're getting, uh, we're mixing up our personal lives and our work lives and they need to be separated uh, for our own mental health and for our own recovery. 
So I think that's important as well. It is. It is important. And as you mentioned, we are creatures of habits, right? Mm -hmm. So we need we need to put uh, even 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 if we work as a home office, it's very important to put our working clothes. Let's say that. Not putting mm -hmm. our pajamas and sitting back on the computer, and I think th this is a very interesting point that the brain activates the secret senses that it is at the moment. So it's very, very important. And I, I, I'm not, I'm not kind of working from office uh, at home in that sense, but uh, uh, I do love going, going to work. It's an amazing, it's an amazing activity. So for me, it's more important. Yes. That reminds me, the same principle, when I was a student, I didn't learn this until university, unfortunately, but this idea of associations. Um, so what I learned from, from the way the brain works in cognitive psychology is these associations. So what I would try to do, of course, they say when you're studying for an exam, the more you can make the environment you're studying in to be similar to the type of environment you're going to be in when you're in an exam, the better you're going to remember. It's called state-dependent learning. Um, one thing I learned, so I, what I one of the main, it's really interesting, the nose and the sense of smells goes right to the hippocampus, like the memory centers of our brain. They're highly connected. So this is why we can smell something and all of a sudden a flood of memories, I'm making this up, it's not true for me, but you smell like apple pie, uh, you had like a Tim Horton, or sorry, uh, Tim Hortons is a Canadian place, like Starbucks, Starbucks or something like this. And <laughs> instantly you remember your grandmother making you know, apple pie and all these memories flood back. Um, one of the tricks is to, and I did this, I used to take uh, this, uh, lavender oil, and I would dip the pen that I would use uh, for when I'm studying. I would dip that pen in. I'd hold this pen in my hand, and I could smell the lavender as I was studying. So when I went to the exam, I would dip the pen again before I went to the exam with that same lavender. So when I was in the exam room, that smell helped my brain get into that state again. And the associations, whenever I didn't smell, I wouldn't put the lavender on any other time. Only when I was oh, studying. Interesting. And then, yeah, and then it would. I mean, I have no proof. That, I mean, I did really well uh, in university, not so much in high school, but it, it, it is one trick that helped me. I, I, I don't have a huge study on this, but I, uh, I believe uh, it's very um, plausible and there's lots of theoretical evidence and there's lots of evidence that, that associations work. So uh, that was one trick it was like a cue that, oh, yeah, this smell. Oh, now I remember, you know, statistics or whatever I was studying. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's another quick trick. It reminds me the the, the trick that uh, real estate. Uh, agents do when they try to sell a house they bake a cake because it yeah. triggers the memories of <laughs> comfort at home yes. Yes. Well, well, uh, the olfactive sense uh, yes. so it's also a nice trick that uh, it's also interesting to see how situations are made right yes in that sense. exactly mm -hmm. okay so dr frizen do you have the the last words for our podcast uh, listeners for today? sure yeah i you know I really believe that people have a lot more potential than they currently believe. Uh, there are many things we can learn from neuroscience, applied neuroscience, cognitive psychology, uh, uh, sports psychology, um, you know, psychophysiology. There's lots of things that we can learn. And if we apply this to our lives, we can I want to use the word unleash our potential, but that's true. We can improve. There's lots of things holding us back um, from when we're, when, our, when we're sleep, our sleep is good, when our nutrition is good, when we're exercising, you know, when we're using these strategies, you're going to perform a lot better than you thought. And I, I, this happened to me when I grew up, I was convinced I was stupid. I thought uh, I was just no good at school. I didn't like school. Um, and I started to believe it. It wasn't until I read books like Tony Robbins when I was like 16 and, and, and Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People that I realized, hey, maybe I have more control over my life than I actually believe. And I started to apply what I learned and you know, things uh, really changed for me personally. So I see this with the clients I work with. We have a lot more potential than we believe. And once we start to kind of hack the system and understand how everything works, we can you know, achieve our goals. What we want to do is live our life based on our goals and values, what we want to achieve and who we want to be in the process. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you so much for the advice, Dr. Fries. And, and we'll uh, put in uh, in our comments in, uh, in our podcast uh, for uh, the listeners uh, all the links also to be able to benefit uh, from your advices, you know, the, the YouTube channel and uh, everything uh, is going to be great for everyone. Thank you. We really appreciate your time. It was uh, Amazing to have you here. No problem. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Dr. Fryzen. No problem. Thank you. So um, we're going to uh, just, uh, if everyone wants to send the thoughts and questions to baw at arden.ac.uk and um, 
we're gonna send we're gonna post uh, your questions and the answers over there we hope you enjoyed our episode with dr chris friesen specially created for arden university brain awareness week podcast thank you